to introduce you to Rob Curry, who's the first Harmony Law speakers this year. Again, we do a number of these over the course of the year, so if you like this one, certainly come and see others, or if you have interest in other topics, we invite you to come back and check out somebody else a little bit later in the term. The, uh, you're, you're lucky to get Rob first, among other things. Uh, he's won teaching awards here, kind of left, right, and center, so he's a celebrated speaker and teacher at the school. Uh, he's got a broad range of things about which he's competent, which is always annoying for those of us who have a slightly smaller range. He's the current director of our Law and Technology Institute, so he's got a fair amount of administrative capacity. As I mentioned, he's a well-celebrated teacher here at the school, and he turns out he's a scholar and expert in the particular area you're going to hear him talk about uh, tonight, International and Transnational Criminal Law. In fact, he has a book with that title, so he is literally the man who's written the book. Uh, on the topic, and he's been uh, cited by Canadian courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada. He writes a blog. He's a very prolific uh, guy in this area, and so we're lucky to have him here at the law school, and certainly I hope you'll get a little piece of how lucky we are in the remarks tonight. Um, I guess I'd say just by way of giving you a bit of sense of uh, who Rob is as a man, one of the things I really like about working with Rob is he's always the go-to guy on something. If you want to uh, sort of short, snippy piece of information about a current case or legal reform. Rob always knows what's going on. He's always on top of it. He's always willing to share his insights and ideas, and I really appreciate that about him. Sometimes people think academics, we sort of hide away from current events and uh, from talking about things with other people, but Rob is definitely not that guy. He's the guy who will sit down and give you a good sense of what's going on. So without more, thank you for giving tonight's uh, opening mini long session. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Dean Brooks. Uh, it's easy to be the guy who gives you the short, pithy <laughs> bit about what's going on when you don't actually know very much about things. You just know a little bit about a lot of things. That's, that's my secret. Um, I welcome to all of you. I'm very happy to see a, a good crowd, a good turnout, and very happy to see students here as well because they don't have to be here. This is optional, so that, uh, not that there's extra points involved. <laughs> Necessary. <laughs> so uh, I am going to talk about extradition. And extradition is, um, I think it's a really exciting topic. It is disturbing at the same time. And uh, most pressingly, I guess, right now, it's been in the news a lot of late. And so I think there's more interest in this topic now than there has been for some time. Uh, even over the last year in Canada, it's been in the news a fair bit, and I can think of a bunch of examples. Uh, the major one is the extradition of Luca Magnata from, I guess it was from France in the end, uh, back to Canada, one of our, not our most prolific serial murderers, but certainly one of our most horrific ones. Uh, that was one of the fastest extraditions I've seen for a while, and that was interesting and, and very much you know, taken up in the press. Um, the well-known Canadian environmental activist Paul Watson is currently on a ship somewhere, on some water somewhere in the world, on the run from not one but two extradition warrants issued for him by Japan and Costa Rica. So he's, uh, he's in a tight situation. Earlier this week, a Guatemalan gentleman named Jorge Sosa was extradited to the U.S. to face immigration charges, which is good in a sense, although Sosa is a wanted war criminal in Guatemala, and there's been some energy put towards the idea of maybe he should go and face those charges uh, first. But that, so that's been controversial. Uh, about three weeks ago, there were reports about a gentleman from New Brunswick, whose name escapes me, who was living in the Philippines and was murdered there. Appeared to be a robbery gone wrong at first, but apparently now there's an allegation that his wife was involved in the murder. And his wife is, or was at last report, in Fredericton, in New Brunswick, where he's from. And of course, that got some attention. Would she be extradited back to the Philippines? And that, that issue has died, but I think it'll probably jump up sometime soon. Um, in Ottawa, there's a professor uh, from, well, he worked at both the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. His name is Hassan Dia. He's been fighting the extradition to France for about five years. There's an allegation that in the early 80s, he was involved in the bombing of a synagogue in a suburb of Paris. Uh, and that's been going on for a long time. Diab maintains, of course, that he wasn't there, didn't do it. Uh, the case has been dragging on 
for a long time. It'll go to the Ontario Court of Appeals sometime next year, I think. It's nearing its final stages, but as we'll discuss, extradition can be a long, drawn-out process. Uh, maybe the weirdest and most drawn-out extradition case doesn't have a Canadian link, but it's the one of Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks guy, who is currently holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, being given uh, asylum by the Ecuadorian government there, because he is facing extradition from the UK to Sweden to uh, be questioned about sexual assault charges. Uh, Mr. Assange claims that it's all smoke and mirrors. In fact, if he ever sets foot in Sweden, the Swedes will send him immediately to the US, where he thinks he's been secretly indicted for doing all kinds of things that the Americans didn't like in the national security sense. And that one is, there are more international law issues involved in that case than could even be put on an exam, although one of these days I might try. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's just Canada, aside from Assange. Extradition is something that goes on all the time throughout the world between any number of countries in the world. And it happens between Canada and the US, <coughs> excuse me, the US very frequently. There is high traffic from here to there. There is some traffic from there to here, but you know, they're 10 times our population. You'd expect that. And yet, despite all of this traffic and despite the media coverage, extradition law and the extradition process itself, I think, remain kind of obscure to most people, to Canadians. And it should be said, some people in many governments throughout the world, including our government, like it that way. And they'd like to keep it that way, keep the extradition law obscure. So I thought, being a contrarian, it would make an interesting topic for a public lecture. And hopefully people will find it interesting but it may also be helpful to know more about it so that you understand fully how it is definitely something you don't want to happen to you. <laughs> so tonight I thought we could do four things. First, I'll give you a bit of background about extradition and what it is. Poor old Nathan, he's bored already, <laughs> taken off. Uh, second, I'll explain something about the extradition process and how it works here in Canada. Third, I'll discuss in a bit more detail some of the more controversial areas of extradition law and maybe give a few opinions about how I think, I think uh, things should be changed. And then fourth, hopefully we'll have time for a bit of discussion. And uh, we, I can take questions or we can just have a, a discussion here in the room. So what is extradition? Well, here's one definition. Extradition is the formal rendition of an alleged criminal fugitive from a state that has custody over the fugitive, which we call the requested state, to a state that wishes to prosecute the fugitive, which we call the requesting state. So I have a very sophisticated diagram here to sort of illustrate this. The idea is that, generally speaking, the person, and we usually call the person the person sought now. We don't say fugitive because that's kind of rude and, and presupposes the guilt. Of the individual. The idea is that the person sought committed some crime in the requesting state and realized he or she would be in trouble and then ran. And they ran to the requested state. The requesting state investigating this crime realizes, finds out somehow where the person sought is, finds out they're in the requested state. Sometimes Interpol is involved in that process. Sometimes it's just, you know, good old police work and communication between national police forces. But they find out. And the requesting state asks the requesting state, please send this individual over to us so that we may give him a trial, so that he may face justice in the requesting state. And that's, in its simplest terms, but that's what it is. That, that's the entire process in a way right there. It's also available where the person sought and in fact has been convicted of a crime in the requesting state, but got away and ran to the requested state. There was a guy named Kingler uh, uh, to whom that happened in, in the uh, 1980s. And he was extradited from Canada back to serve his sentence, which in fact was death. And we'll talk about that a little more later. Now, when you read reports in the media about people who are sent by the government from one state to another, 
there's sometimes confusion about what process is being used and what's going on. So it may be helpful to explain what extradition is by telling you about other processes that are not extradition. Because you hear a lot of words used interchangeably. I've heard there's one story, I think it was one of the early stories about Assange where the reporter used the words extradition, deportation, and expulsion all to mean the same thing. Which, you know, in the colloquial dictionary sense of the words would kind of make sense, but each of them has a very distinct legal meaning. So first of all, extradition is not deportation. Deportation is a device that's used under immigration law and not under criminal law. With deportation, the government has determined that you are in the country illegally for some reason. Maybe your work permit expired. Maybe your student visa expired and you didn't leave like you were supposed to. Maybe you lied on your refugee application and the government has decided to, to remove you and you are removed. You are forcibly removed from the country and you're deported. You would usually be sent to your country of origin, but you can also be sent to any country that will take you. Uh, the focus with deportation then is on getting somebody out of the country rather than getting them to any place. Extradition is also not expulsion. Now expulsion means different things in different contexts, but a good example of expulsion would be situations where a government looks at some employees of a foreign embassy and says, you know what, they say they're computer technicians, but we think they're spies. And we have evidence that they're spies. But if they're there, with diplomatic credentials, they can't be arrested, they can't be tried because they have diplomatic immunity. But the government may expel them. So that would be expulsion. You, guy in the Russian embassy, this happened, get on a plane, you're out. But that's not extradition. This one might be obvious, extradition is not abduction. There is an unfortunate history of governments getting tired of waiting for extradition, which can take a long time and sending agents to kidnap people who are wanted fugitives uh, to get them back to their country for prosecution or maybe something worse than prosecution. Uh, a great example is Eichmann. I don't know if Eichmann was abducted from Argentina and was eventually tried in, uh, in Israel for his crimes during World War II and suffered not a fate worse than death. He suffered the fate of death. And nobody's crying for Eichmann. But that was an abduction. Happened right here. An induction happened here in Canada uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. A guy named Jaffe was kidnapped by bounty hunters from Toronto. This happens. Similarly, extradition is not extraordinary rendition, which we've heard a lot about since 9-11, particularly in the, in the first seven or eight years after. Extraordinary rendition was where government agents picked up an individual in one country and shipped them to another place where they could be interrogated or tortured. So the distinction from simple abduction is that they weren't taken back to have a trial. They were taken somewhere else to have things done to them. Unfortunately, that also happened with the Canadian angle, as we know from the case of Meher Arar, uh, as well as several others. So with all of that, there are two big differences between extradition and all of these things. So first, unlike at least abduction, an extraordinary rendition, extradition is a legal process. The courts are involved, government decision makers are involved. There is a law called the Extradition Act, the federal statute, that sets the rules for how extradition works. People are entitled to get assistance from lawyers. They get procedural rights. They receive this assistance. Second though, all of these other processes are things that countries do basically out of self-interest to help themselves in some way. So if you're deporting someone, you're administering your immigration law, as I said, you're just trying to get them out. Extradition, though, is a way for countries to help each other. It's a way that countries cooperate with each other, and it's very much based on the idea of reciprocity. You do it for me, I'll do it for you. Of course, it's a, it's a self-interested kind of cooperation as well. We want to explore that a little bit. Why is it self-interested, but why do countries do it? These days, extraditions often invoked and spoken of as, as part of the, the global fight against transnational organized crime. It also makes you think of globalization, whatever that means. But it certainly means that 
people and money and drugs and all kinds of illegality can move around the world very quickly and widely around the world. So that all sounds very modern and hip, if it's hip to say hip anymore. But <laughs> the story of extradition, in fact, begins in ancient Egypt. I am not making this up, as Dave Barry would say. Some years ago, archaeologists uncovered what is thought to be the first extradition treaty ever and one of the first international treaties ever. So we're not talking about yesterday. This treaty saw the Egyptian Empire agreeing with some neighboring kingdoms that if criminals fled into Egypt, they would be apprehended and returned to the place from whence they came, where they committed the crime. And these countries or empires agreed to do the same thing for Egypt. So this is early recognition, really early recognition, of a modern reality. People tend to think of crime as being local, and in fact it most often is, but it's not unusual at all for crime to have effects that spill over into other countries. And if the governments of different countries are going to effectively suppress crime, then it's in their mutual best interest and our mutual best interest that they cooperate with each other in doing so. And if states are going to cooperate with each other, then logically they do that by way of international law. And the form of international law that governs most extradition is, is treaties. And treaties are simply agreements, formalized agreements between countries. Extradition treaties are usually bilateral, which means they're between two countries. Uh, there are sometimes big multilateral treaties between large groups of countries which do provide for extradition. Canada participates in both. We've signed on to a number of multilateral treaties, but also have a fair network of, uh, of bilateral extradition treaties. And I think it's worth saying that extradition, therefore, is a major part of how transnational crime is suppressed. And for Canadians, it's in our best interest that Canada have a good network of extradition treaties and a solid and efficient extradition system. I think it's worth saying that, in part, because academics are often criticized for, well, always being critical. Certainly I speak to Crown extradition lawyers from time to time, and more than once I've heard variations on the statement, Ugh, academics hate extradition. So let's be clear here. I, at least, whoever cares what I think, I do not hate extradition. In fact, I think Canadians are often too complacent about transnational and I think we should all be more invested than we are in making sure we have a solid and fair and efficient extradition system. I will, of course, have a few recommendations for how it can be made better. So how does the extradition process work? I think the best idea maybe is to work through an imaginary case which will take us through the steps of how it would happen, how it could happen to any of us. So let's imagine the story of Bill who's a 25-year-old guy from Halifax who went on an all-inclusive vacation to a resort in Costa Rica. And one night he went off resort, he went to a local bar with some friends, got a little drunk, and he beat up a local guy, pretty bad. He left the bar, though, before the police showed up. And the next day, sensing the worst, he cut short his trip and he flew home to Halifax. And it turns out the police showed up at the resort to arrest him a few hours later, but he was already gone. The police in Costa Rica want to prosecute Bill, or have him prosecuted by their courts, for assault causing bodily harm. And they find out from the hotel that Bill lives in Halifax. And they talk to their government lawyers, and the government lawyers say, right, well, Costa Rica has an extradition arrangement with Canada. So maybe we can get this guy back. Bill is back in Halifax thinking, no trouble, got away from that. What happened? First, there's a request. The government of Costa Rica would send a request to a Department of Justice Canada in Ottawa called the International Assistance Group. And this is a specialized division of lawyers uh, that handle our extradition relations with other states, and they advise the Minister of Justice on these issues. Now, Costa Rica might formally request the extradition of Bill from Halifax back, back to Costa Rica, or they might send a request that Bill be arrested on a provisional basis so that they have some time to put together a formal request. In either case, 
lawyers in the International Assistance Group would look at the request, they'd look at our extradition agreement, they'd make sure that the request applied with all the, the parts of the agreement and the requirements under Canada's Extradition Act. Make sure all the boxes are checked and all the, the I's are dotted and P's crossed. If they did, then the department would issue a ministerial order called an authority to proceed, or an ATP. So that's the first stage. The ATP essentially brings to life the Canadian justice system to process this request. So then they would send the documentation, including the ATP, to a prosecutor here in Halifax. And that prosecutor would get an arrest warrant from a court here in Halifax. And then the Halifax police would show up, possibly the RCMP, would show up at Bill's door and arrest him. And he would go to jail. Probably just for a short time, he would probably be able to be bailed out. He might have to surrender his passport, though, as part of the bail conditions, so that he couldn't flee Canada pending the resolution of Costa Rica's request. So, we're all built. What's next? After a while, there would be a hearing before a judge of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia called a committal hearing. And this is often just called the extradition hearing, historically it was. At the committal hearing, the judge has to decide two things. And I will tell you what they are. First, is Bill indeed the person whom the Costa Rican government wants extradited? That's usually not a big deal. There have been cases where the wrong person was requested, or it couldn't really be deter <coughs> excuse me, determined from the request uh, who the individual was. Usually not a problem. Second, though, at the committal hearing, the judge has to decide whether the requesting state, in this case Costa Rica, has presented enough evidence to justify the extradition. So this is an important point. People are not just extradited because another person, another country asks for them. The requesting state has to prove to a Canadian judge that they not only have grounds to suspect that a crime has been committed, but that they have evidence that they will present in court when they do the trial back in the requesting state, back in Costa Rica. So the judge's job is to look at the evidence, and then she asks herself two questions. First question is, is what Costa Rica is alleging Bill did a crime here in Canada? This is often called double criminality. The idea is simply that most countries generally don't extradite anyone to face prosecution for something that's not against the criminal law in the requested state. So as a simple example, in Kentucky, you can be prosecuted for the crime of buggery. I'm not making this up. You could not be extradited from Canada to face prosecution in Kentucky for the crime of buggery because we don't recognize it as a crime. It's been off our books for quite a while. So that couldn't happen. So the judge makes that determination. Then the judge looks at the evidence that the requesting state says it has, because often all that's there is a summary of the evidence, and asks herself this. If that evidence was presented to a Canadian court, is it possible that the person would be found guilty for this crime? If so, then Bill is committed for extradition by the judge. That's why we call it a committal hearing. Now, note that last question that the judge is asking. She doesn't say, on the basis of this evidence, would I find Bill guilty? Just, is it possible? The way it's phrased is, would a reasonable jury, uh, properly instructed, acting reasonably, find Bill to be, uh, could it find Bill to be guilty on the basis of this evidence? This is an important point. Extradition is not a trial here. We have a court part, we have a hearing. It's not a trial here for the offense committed in Costa Rica. It's just a process by which Canada decides whether or not to send Bill back to Costa Rica for his trial. Okay? <clears throat> that has implications. And they're not always very friendly implications to the person sought. So for example, Bill's lawyer will have uh, 
the request documents from Costa Rica. And Bill might look at the stuff and say, hey, they have a witness who says, I started the fight. But that witness is lying. That guy came at me with a broken bottle, and I was just defending myself. And you know, I think self-defense is a total defense, and you, know, you shouldn't extradite me. And Bill might be pretty angry about being extradited down to Costa Rica to face trial based on the testimony of a witness who he knows is lying. But our extradition law, and the extradition law of most countries, says if you have an argument to make about self-defense, make it at your trial in Costa Rica. We're not doing that here. The trial is not here. There is a little bit of space for Bill to argue that Costa Rica doesn't have a good case against it. It's a very small space that the Crown has tried for years to keep closed, and the courts open, but have been narrowing it as well. I'll talk about that a bit later. One other thing the extradition judge can do is this. If the requesting state has been acting in an unfair or in an abusive manner, the committal judge, the extradition judge, can put a stop to the whole thing. Very unusual. It doesn't happen very often. I think there are about six cases in Canada where it's happened. A very um, <coughs> noteworthy one is a case called Cobb. Cobb and a bunch of others uh, had clearly been involved in some illegal fraud down in the US. They were all wanted for extradition. They all had a lot of money and they fought extradition for a long time. Uh, at one point, the prosecutor in the American case went on W5 and said, these guys should stop resisting extradition. Because if they don't, when they get down here, we're going to put them in prison and make them the boyfriends of very bad men. That was a bit disturbing. And the judge who had been supervising the case in the US made some remarks as well, some public remarks which were not, didn't give an, a, a sense of fairness about the whole thing. And the Supreme Court of Canada said, right, we're putting a stop to that. This is a situation where our otherwise good friend and good extradition partner, the US, has abused the process of the Canadian courts. So it is the judge at the committal hearing who can do that. This happened quite recently, in fact, in the case of Abdullah Khadr. Abdullah Khadr is the older brother of the famous Omar Khadr. And Abdullah Khadr was um, apprehended uh, by Pakistani authorities in, uh, in Afghanistan at the request of the American government. And he was, uh, they, were, they paid a bounty on him, in fact. It was a half a million dollar bounty on his head. He was taken to Pakistan. He was kept in some kind of security detention. He was mistreated quite vigorously. He was interrogated quite ruthlessly by the Pakistani intelligence service and uh, the CIA as well. And uh, they got intelligence out of him. Canadian government officials were in the background saying, I think you've got our citizen in there because Cotter is a Canadian citizen and were stopped at every turn by the Pakistanis acting at the request of the Americans. Uh, Cotter was eventually released into Canadian custody, whereupon the Americans uh, made an immediate extradition request for him to face uh, terrorism charges down there. And uh, Justice Chris Speyer of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice issued an abusive process order and stopped the entire um, proceeding, again, because he had been mistreated at the behest of the very government that was now requesting his extradition. And that order was upheld by the Ontario Court of Appeal. It was upheld because the Crown appealed it. The Crown wanted to extradite Cotter down to the US, despite all of this. Now, they had an obligation to act for their treaty partner as well, so I'm not suggesting the Crown is just off on a frolic of its own here. The Ontario Court of Appeal overturned the thing quite, or didn't overturn it, so it held, upheld it quite strongly. The Crown appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada denied leave to appeal, which means they said they wouldn't hear the case. So that one went all the way up. Top courts. Okay, so, but back to the committal hearing. As I said, that abusive process thing is, is unusual. If the judge decides that Costa Rica's case is in order, then Bill is committed. That means that the case now goes to Canada's Minister of Justice. And the minister makes the ultimate decision 
about whether or not Bill should be extradited or what we call surrendered to Costa Rica. Now, the minister's decision is often described as one that mixes law and politics. And that might sound irregular, but it really isn't. It's a legal decision that the minister makes because the minister's decision has to comply with the Extradition Act and the various requirements in it, and it also has to comply with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's said to be political because in making the decision, the minister has to be concerned with Canada's relations with the other states, with its extradition treaty partner states. Extradition can be a heavily political matter, and a refusal to extradite when you have a treaty obligation to do so could have diplomatic consequences. So there is a, there's a political aspect to it in the international politics sense, the diplomacy sense, I guess you'd say. So the result is that the courts are very deferential to the minister's decision. And while they can overturn a surrender decision, they are very unlikely to do so. And they do not do so with any frequency. Now, there are some limits on the minister's ability to surrender, uh, most of which are built right into the Extradition Act itself. The minister is meant to refuse surrender in, for example, in obvious cases. If it's clear that the requesting state will torture Bill, or that the prosecution in Costa Rica is based on some kind of discrimination against Bill. And by discrimination, I mean, you know, in, like in the racial sense, that kind of thing. Or if it's really a political matter. You know, if Bill was, in fact, going back and forth to Costa Rica a fair bit, and he got involved in local politics, and he was involved with the opposition party, and the government didn't like him, and they were trying to get him back so that they could do harm to him under the guise of a regular criminal prosecution. So the minister would be meant to refuse extradition in that kind of case. Um, at this stage, the surrender decision stage, Bill is entitled to make submissions to the minister, written submissions. More realistically, of course, Bill has his lawyer make those submissions. The lawyer can argue that one of those things I just mentioned earlier is happening, or that there's some other reason that it would be unjust or oppressive to extradite Bill to Costa Rica. Maybe Bill is, uh, is ill. Uh, maybe he's mentally unstable. And you know, bad things might happen to him if he's surrendered, that kind of thing. For the most part, these arguments never work, and the minister orders surrender. Now, Bill could then go to the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal and argue that the minister's decision was wrong. So it's a judicial review of the surrender decision. But to make out that argument, Bill has to meet a very high standard. And that standard is the court would have to decide that it would shock the conscience of Canadians for him to be extradited to Costa Rica in this situation. Now, these shocks the conscience cases are rare. In fact, this has happened, this argument has been made successfully only four times, at least on the modern uh, version of the test. The first time was in a case called Burns in 2001, Burns and Rathet who were uh, the subject of an extradition request from the US. They were not delightful people. Burns had basically uh, acted as a contract killer for Rathe to kill Rathe's entire family so that they could, gain, they could get the insurance money and split it between them. They were eventually convicted of this. Uh, but what they, they fled Washington State to Vancouver. They were arrested. And the extradition request was made, but they were going to face the death penalty. They went down there. The Supreme Court of Canada eventually ruled in 2001 that it would be against the charter, against charter values. It would shock the conscience of Canadians to extradite anyone to face the death penalty. Because the worldwide trend was towards abolition of the death penalty. Now, Canadians don't have the death penalty anymore. We haven't had it for quite a while. And that that was. Uh, not going to happen. It happened in the, in the case of a guy called Rudy Pacificado, who came out on the wrong side of the big change of government in the Philippines. And the Filipino government had no extradition treaty with Canada, but 
negotiated one over the course of years because they really wanted to get Rudy Pacificado. The litigation lasted at least 10 years, I think it was 11. And in the end, the Ontario Court of Appeal found on the evidence that what Pacificado was facing if he was sent back to the Philippines was basically indefinite imprisonment with no access to legal advice, with no access to a court even to inquire as to why he was being detained. And there was evidence that the government of the Philippines was messing around with the judiciary, interfering with the court process. Uh, the third time it happened successfully was in a case called Fowler out of the Quebec Court of Appeal last year. Um, a weird little case. It had to do with uh, extradition to face uh, a life without parole sentence. The fourth time it happened was in a case called Leonard, and it happened like six days ago in Ontario. Uh, two guys, both Aboriginal, both narcotics offenders, or at least alleged narcotics traffickers, uh, sought to be extradited to the US. It was clear that in American sentencing law, their, their status as Aboriginal people and the conditions that they basically grew up under were not going to be taken into account in putting a sentence together. And in Canada, that's how we do things. We take that into account. And it was, uh, the Court of Appeal held it would be too shocking and too oppressive for those things not to be taken into account, and they put a stop to it. But that's four cases since 2001. What about Bill? Anything shocking to the conscience about Bill's case? Probably not. Run of the mill, assault, Nothing particularly out of the ordinary about it, assuming that the Costa Rican court system works okay. Are we happy about this? Well, we have an interest in justice being done. And that assault victim in Costa Rica, if indeed he is an assault victim, deserves justice as well. And when you look at more serious criminals, like people who are engaged in heavy duty fraud, cybercrime, robbing people, murderers, rapists. The alternative to extraditing them from Canada is that they will stay here, where we can't often can't prosecute them for what they did. So that's not a particularly palatable idea either. So Bill may very well go to Costa Rica. Now it'll be rough on old Bill. He'll be put in jail after the surrender decision is issued. He'll be flown to Costa Rica. He will likely get access to a lawyer there, but probably not what we would call effective representation by our standards. And it's entirely possible that he'll get a much longer prison sentence there than he would have gotten here. And it's easy to imagine that the prison conditions he's going to face in Costa Rica will not be comfortable. Although I gather the Don Jail is pretty bad as well. So up in Ontario, just to be fair. So all of that, you know, might make us unhappy about Bill in some sense, because he just got into a bar fight. Neither the Crown nor the courts care very much about that. And that's the way the law is structured. The courts are very slowly starting to come around to the idea that it might not be fair to extradite people when they'll get a massively larger sentence in the requesting state than they would here, but we're not there yet. That's a problem, though. The law, our extradition law, presumes that the requesting state is an acceptable place to send anyone, including a Canadian citizen, to face trial. The law assumes that the government of Canada has investigated the treaty partner state, has considered its justice system, and has found it to be an acceptable place to extradite, and on that basis formed a treaty. It's nearly impossible to overcome this presumption. But would you want to be extradited to Thailand, or Argentina, or Russia, or Liberia, or Colombia, or Romania? These are some of the countries with whom we do business, extradition-wise. If you read reports about these countries by Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, that might answer the question for you. That's not a law enforcement network, that's a rogues gallery. If you were a tourist 
or living briefly in one of those countries, and you got into some kind of disagreement with the local authorities, and they charged you criminally after you left, would you want to be extradited back there? I wouldn't. And as you may have guessed, that's one of the few problems that I want to point out. Now again, caveat. Having good, strong extradition laws is in all of our interest. And before you think I'm all about beating up on the Crown, it's really important to acknowledge that the Minister of Justice and that Department of Lawyers have difficult jobs, and they do their jobs well, and they do good things. There was a difficult case regarding an extradition to Thailand. Uh, I think it ended about four years ago. And in that case, the uh, minister essentially negotiated an agreement with the government of Thailand uh, saying, we need some special conditions imposed on this situation. And we need you, government of Thailand, to assure us that you can protect this guy, that nothing will happen to him in custody. You know, he won't fall down and get 10 bullet holes in his body. This kind of stuff. Uh, you know, looking out for the interests of that person. That's a good thing. Uh, in the case before the Quebec Court of Appeal, I mentioned a few minutes ago, the minister went clearly on the record saying that extraditing a minor to face a life without parole sentence would be contrary to the basic principles of justice. The minister said that he would not order that. And that's a good thing, too. Okay. There are some other things, though, that might cause you concern, or at least would bear thinking about. Um, just as an example, on the poster that was advertising this, um, this talk out around um, the community asked this question. Do you have to leave Canada to be targeted for extradition? Now, I wrote that, and I realized after it's not that clear. What I meant was... <laughs> Can you be extradited somewhere else for something you did in Canada? And the answer to that question is yes, sometimes. Sometimes countries use what's called extraterritorial jurisdiction to prosecute people for things they do in other countries or outside the one state. And there's nothing wrong or illegal about that. It's very standard under international law. For example, Canada has now prosecuted two individuals who were involved in the Rwandan genocide. Why? Because they ended up here. And we were best suited to try them. Did we otherwise have any jurisdiction over it? Of course not. No part of the Rwandan genocide happened here in Canada. But we exercised extraterritorial jurisdiction over the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. So this extraterritorial jurisdiction jazz, it's a good thing, right? as long as the process is followed. And it can produce good results. So let's put Bill in another situation. Say that Bill had a little operation here in Halifax where he would phone up senior citizens in um, Louisiana, and he would defraud them by selling them insurance policies that didn't exist. And that he would then you know, he'd go back and get another policy and he would tap out the life savings of these people. And he made a million bucks doing this. Okay. Could we prosecute Bill here for doing this? Well, yes, part of it happened here. He made the phone calls from here. He probably put his money in a bank here. Maybe, maybe he put his money in a bank in Costa Rica. Who knows? We could prosecute him here. But the victims who require justice are in the US, in Louisiana. We could extradite him down there and nobody would really be too disturbed. That's OK. It's not going to be that attractive, though, in every case. What about computer hacking? That can happen in a number of places. You know, the place where the individual is sitting doing the hacking is only one of the many, many places that the crime could touch. And this has become a big issue in the UK. There's a guy named Gary McKinnon who is an expert computer hacker. He's also autistic. Or he has Asperger's syndrome. He hacked into the um, systems at the American Department of Defense from his bedroom in Upper Leeds upon Leighton Avon, or wherever it was that he lived, in England, and apparently did a lot of damage. There's some 
allegation. He did about $300 million worth of damage. That is very doubtful. What is not doubtful is that the American government's really mad at him. And he's been charged under every law they can think of in the US. The British government cannot wait to extradite McKinnon over to the US. And the only thing that's kept him there is the massive public outcry and really good lawyering by his defense lawyers. The idea simply being, look at this guy, look at his situation. Could we prosecute him here? Yes, for what he did. Britain has laws that would allow them to prosecute him. Even though the damage occurred in the US, they could prosecute him for the hacking. Probably better for him to face British justice in that sense than to go to a place where there is, uh, shall we say, stronger feelings about what's going on. Extraterritorial jurisdiction, not always good. Canadian example, Mark Emery, the Prince of Pot. Remember him? Here's a guy who sold a lot of marijuana seeds, among his various other activities. He sold seeds by mail order. He sold many of them to Americans. Did he ever leave Canada? Not to my knowledge. At least he didn't go to the US. Uh, eventually, after a long public campaign, a long drawn out prosecution, charges were laid against him in the US for this. And he launched into an extradition proceeding, which uh, many of us thought was going to go on for a long time. We'd go to the Supreme Court of Canada and we would you know, get some things resolved there. Because of course the offensive part of that is that this is a crime that we barely even enforce in Canada. It is on the books. It's under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. But not one that there's a lot of vigor, nor a lot of political will for in Canada. Uh, but Emery um, didn't contest extradition in the end. He struck a plea bargain with the American prosecutors um, to basically let some of his friends and associates off the hook. And he went down and is now in prison down there. Now again, is there anything illegal about the Americans asserting jurisdiction over this offense? No. It had effects in the US. They take jurisdiction over that kind of thing the same way that we would. There's nothing offensive about that. I suggest, though, that Canadians might want to ask themselves whether we think it's acceptable for a Canadian to be extradited down there for selling marijuana seeds. This isn't Bill defrauding widows in Louisiana. Different thing. People might want to talk about that, at least have a democratic type dialogue. My next point is this. The main idea behind extradition historically was that it was geared towards the really serious kinds of crime. Murder would be an obvious one. The lower level stuff, what we would call summary conviction offenses or what you know, are often called misdemeanors in American criminal law, were never meant to be caught by extradition. Extradition proceedings are expensive. They are time consuming. This kind of stuff's not what we want our tax dollars to be spent on. That was the rationale. However, in many of our current extradition arrangements, including our treaty with the US, Bill or you can be extradited for any crime that would get you a sentence of one year or more if you did it in Canada. One year is not much of a sentence. You don't even go to a federal penitentiary if you get a one year sentence. The result is that Canadians and others can be extradited for what I can only describe as a bewildering variety of minor garden variety offenses. What kind of minor conduct? I'm talking about, for example, someone who steals a child tax benefit check worth $70, fraudulently endorses it and cashes it. It's right there in section 362 of the criminal code. You can get up to two years for that. I'm not suggesting that there'd be big extradition traffic on that offense, but that's the kind of low level offense. Uh, I'm talking about someone running a bingo. It's right there in section 206 of the criminal code. It never gets prosecuted. Half of the Catholic Church would be in jail if it did. <laughs> but it's there. And that's not even counting the array of very small potatoes regulatory offenses under hundreds of statutes. Now, surely I'm exaggerating. Surely this is hyperbolic. You know, 
we, we can leave this to prosecutorial discretion. Right? Rationally speaking, no American prosecutor is going to commit a lot of resources to really low end stuff. Extradition is expensive, time consuming. Judges and lawyers and bureaucrats on both sides of the border working and working. You know, surely that's not going to happen. Let me tell you a story about a guy from Fredericton, New Brunswick named Dwight Hickey. Dwight lived in Yellowknife for a while and he was given as a present a polar bear rug, which he didn't really have any use to, but hey, you know, you're in the north, he hung it on the wall. Dwight moved down to Georgia, to Mason, Georgia, in the U.S., to uh, open up a home, basically a transition home for uh, people who had been released from mental institutions. He and his sister and his brother-in-law opened this charity home. Or they, they were planning to, and they were living there in Mason, but they, and they found a facility they wanted to rent to have the home in, but they couldn't come up with the money. And then out of the blue, like a godsend, some guy lands, I heard about your polar bear rug, you want to sell it? Because Dwight had sent for a few of his things in the Yukon, just some clothes and boxes and stuff, and his friends had sent all of his stuff to him, including the polar bear rug, which he never asked for, but there it was. And so Dwight said, yeah, I could sell that. So the guy buys the rug from him for about $4,000, I think it was. And Dwight takes the $4,000 and is able to put the first and last month's rent on the charity house, which is great. So that operates. Um, then Dwight's relationship with his sister kind of went wrong, decided he'd go home. So he goes home to, to Fredericton, or Muckville, just outside Fredericton, and forgot all about it until spring of 2009, the Fredericton police showed up at his door and said, you are under arrest. We have an extradition warrant for you from the state of Georgia. You, Dwight Hickey, are wanted on three charges of importation, possession, and sale of a part of a protected animal. Three charges. Federal environmental offenses in the U.S. Five years maximum sentence each. Now, what do you have gotten 15 years? Of course not. In Canada, if he had been prosecuted at all, it would have been under the version of our law that says six months or a $25,000 fine. Probably talking a suspended sentence and a, uh, and a minor fine because those laws are set up to get traffickers in wildlife parts and protected wildlife parts and they're very good laws and they're very important. But Dwight was going to be extradited to face federal charges in Georgia for this. And he went through the entire extradition process. Um, I got involved in the case towards the end. And a lot of energy was being put towards the judicial review of the minister's surrender decision. But the minister, Rob Nicholson, ordered him discharged and declined to extradite which we thought was a miracle. Certainly unusual, not as unusual as some defense lawyers would tell you, but it was unusual. Um, I think it was due, I'm pretty clear it was due in no small part to the fact that the media got a hold of the story. Um, some pressure was put on the government. There was a big letter writing campaign. People were openly threatening to make this a big political issue. And to be fair, it was an unusual kind of case. So why did I bring it up? To underscore this point about how you can be extradited for something you would get a year for. I said, surely no sane prosecutor would seek to have you extradited for small potato stuff. Apparently not. This also raises the problem of sentencing. Though quite apart from minor crime, major crime. As I said, Dwight here, six months, Fine up to 25000 up to 15 years in the federal pen in the U.S. There's, a, there's an imbalance there. It's one thing to say that it's okay to extradite someone if both countries think the conduct is criminal. It's entirely another thing to say that it's a good idea to extradite someone to a country where they'll get 10 times the sentence 
they would if convicted in Canada. But the Minister of Justice, to say the least, has been hostile to this idea uh, in all the litigation that's gone on. Um, and our law is structured that way as well. Um, think about life no parole. Life no parole, no eligibility for parole, is a sentence that's available in the judicial systems of a number of our treaty partners. Is that really an acceptable sentence anymore? Life, no parole, no chance of parole, even if you get rehabilitated, even if you find God and get really good after doing 15 years in prison? We don't have life, no parole in this country for good reason. And the courts are pushing back on that one. But we're not there yet. Another problem. Remember at the committal hearing stage, the judge looks at the evidence that the requested state has presented or says it has, because all they have to do is present a summary and a signed guarantee from a government official in the requesting state saying, we have this evidence and we will present it at trial. I mentioned early on a guy named Hassan Dia who is facing those terrorism charges in extradition to France. At the extradition hearing in Hassan Dia's case, the main evidence against him, and there were, there were five or six different, I should say, groups of kinds of evidence that France indicated that it had. A lot of it was very circumstantial, to say the least. And circumstantial evidence is not necessarily bad or weak, but a lot of it was not very convincing. The main evidence that they had was a handwriting sample from the hotel that the bomber had stayed at. And the handwriting sample of the bomber's handwriting had been matched to a sample of Diaz's handwriting by a handwriting analysis expert that France had employed to do this. And this is, you know, this is criminal evidence, lots of kinds of stuff. You can beat down the requesting state's evidence if you can demonstrate that it's manifestly unreliable. The extradition judge is meant to look at the case and say, if the case is based in, you know, in a major way on manifestly unreliable evidence, then it should not go. Dieb had at least two and I think three other handwriting experts, all of whom demolished the evidence of the French expert. They questioned her methodology in particular. Uh, they basically made a hash of that evidence, demonstrating, if I read the case, I think they demonstrated it was manifestly unreliable. Justice Marringer, who was the extradition judge, um, said quite clearly it was a hard case. He had a difficult decision to make. At the end of his judgment, he said, the French case against Mr. Diab is very weak. Anywhere in the world where he got a fair trial, he would not be convicted on this evidence. Nonetheless, my hands are tied. I have to commit. That was his reading of the law. That was the reading of the law the Minister of Justice urged on him successfully, if reluctantly on Justice Marriage's part. So there will be an appeal on that one. It's going to be Ontario Court of Appeal. We'll see what happens with that. I think, though, it's emblematic of a certain problem with that part of the extradition process. Two other things. You can tell I can go on about this for a while. Two other things. Um, and this is more of a general airy-fairy law professor kind of thing to say. There's a certain anti-democratic quality about all of this. Okay. Because uh, I don't want to come across as if I'm blaming the Minister of Justice for everything. All of this is enshrined in our law, in the Extradition Act, how it's been interpreted by the courts. Okay. But do we ever talk about extradition, about extradition law? We talk about extradition. We talked about Luca Magnata until we were blue in the face. But we don't talk about the law. We need to talk about it. On a more general level, I think Canadians need to be more aware of this law and how it operates. And they should be aware, of course, that it operates effectively 
in many situations and does good things and protects us and helps the cause. They should also be made aware that there are problems and people fall through the cracks. I think we need to exercise our entitlement to have a little more input into this process. Extradition treaties, though, are drafted and negotiated by government lawyers. The Extradition Act, our, our new act from 1999, was designed by Crown lawyers with the express goal that it would serve Crown purposes well. Now, the Crown is us. Let's remember that. It's a representative democracy. But the us part of us didn't have much input in that process. The treaties are not tabled before Parliament, or to the extent they are, it's a very pro forma exercise and nobody really pays attention. The treaties are negotiated behind closed doors. And I can tell you as an extradition researcher that many Crown lawyers are very secretive about extradition generally. Not all, by any means. Many are. So I'll just close on that point, I guess. I, I think we need to re-democratize our law. I think we need to take back our extradition law. We're already well along the road to making sure it's efficient and that it operates well, that it serves our needs, that it serves the needs, and by our needs, I mean our law enforcement needs, and it serves the law enforcement needs of our treaty partners. That part, I think, we've, we've got down. It's time that we spent more energy on making it fair. And I hope maybe after tonight you'll give that some thought, because you can be the next bill. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me for this long. Um, I'm happy to take questions. We can have a discussion. Throw things at me, whatever you wish to do. You would do, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm, I wouldn't give this to you in the sense of legal advice, but I, I think you have the answer, which is get in touch with whatever representative of Canada you can track down right. in that country. The consulate will give you a certain amount of help, uh, and that's well programmed. You know, they all, they know what to do. They typically know the local processes. You should be able to get access to local legal counsel that way. Um, and the other thing you would want to do, particularly if you were banged up, um, you know, in, in prison or in a, in, a, in a criminal process, is make sure people here in Canada know what's going on because there are uh, personnel at like Foreign Affairs and International Training in Ottawa who work on these files as well. And they would certainly be keeping track of your situation. If there were um, communications to be made to the foreign government, then those are the people who do it. Uh, it's really important in these cases that you have somebody here to agitate for you because it is the government we're dealing with in the end and bureaucrats are the same everywhere. You want to have an advocate, you want to make sure that somebody is keeping the ball rolling. There are lots of, of success stories where Canadians were in, in trouble in foreign countries. There was that woman who was in prison in Mexico. Uh, they got her out eventually not long ago. Uh, you know, a, a deal was done behind the scenes, and that's what you want to happen in that situation. Um, access as much help as you can. If you're of modest resources, though, that can be a challenge. And if your name is Omar Cotter, you won't get any help from the government of Canada. And Omar Cotter's not the only one. 
and I, I suppose that's the closing point on that, is it may depend on who you are and what you're alleged to have done. Because this government picks and chooses its favorites, who it will support and who it won't. And all you have to do is think of Abuski and Abarazic and um, somebody else on my radar. Oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Smith in Montana, who Canada agitated the, the government of Montana for years to not execute him because he's on death row. And then a very quick decision was made to not do that. And uh, that went to the Federal Court of Canada. The Federal Court said that the decision-making process by the government had, was unfair. And they said, okay, Federal Government, this is Justice Barnes from Halifax. Said that. Justice Barnes said, okay, Federal Government, get that policy out that the Liberals had about how where any Canadian facing death row in any country of the world, you would make representations to that government to say, please don't execute our citizen, please show mercy. Take out that policy, dust it off, and apply it to Ronald Smith, said the federal court. So the government of Canada wrote a letter to the uh, clemency authorities in Montana. Dear clemency authorities, we are writing this letter in support of the application of Ronald Smith for clemency from the death penalty because the Federal Court of Canada has ordered us to do so. That's how this government does business. Now, I'm verging way over into political commentary here, which is maybe not what you came for, but my students will tell you I have many opinions. That's sort of comes kind of where my next question was. Just reading you know, through the paper, you get the impression that Canada is taking a hands off. I don't think so. I think that's a, um, that's a perception. And in some cases it has done that. And those cases have gotten a lot of coverage. I think it would be unfair to the government to say that that's their policy. It very much depends on what the situation is, who the person is. And I think the best example of where it's not true is the case of Abdullah Qadr. And Abdullah Qadr on the evidence is a very bad guy. He is probably a terrorist. He's our citizen. But the Canadian government, when he was apprehended in Pakistan, he was being you know, mistreated and interrogated. The Canadian government officials were right in there all the time saying, you have to give him to us. You have to give us information. We have to get access to him. You're breaching your obligations under three different international treaties. So the government was right in there, not just the Liberals, you know, the Harper government as well. Uh, they were in there trying to get access to him. They were very aggressive in their attempt to extradite him to the U.S. once he got back here. But there's an example where you know, it wouldn't be true to the stereotype of this government, their conduct. But you had good diplomats, good lawyers, who, and mostly there were a couple of agents from CSIS who were doing that work. And they did very good work. So you know, it, it's, it's a bit more complex, I would say, than the media has made it out to be. I wouldn't want to be the test case. I wouldn't want to be the one in trouble and say, are they going to help me or are they not going to help me? Eric? Is Omar Khadr always received the same level of support from the federal government, or is it any different under the uh, liberals? O Omar or Abdullah? Omar. Omar, no, pretty much the same across the board. And that's, you know, that's another fair thing. This government has a reputation for being very law and order oriented, but the current very aggressive stance of our extradition law goes back to the liberals, for sure. They dreamed it up, they designed it. This government's been happy to carry on with it, but they haven't had to change anything. Other than, I would say, the level of energy that they put into extradition. Yes? If Bill decides to run away from the country and come back to Canada, and that country doesn't have a treaty with Canada, does the treaty have to be negotiated before they can ask for a bill back? Uh, yes and no. No in the sense that they don't have to spend years doing a formal treaty, uh, but yes in the sense that they could make an arrangement saying, okay, whatever country, we don't have an extradition treaty and we, we're not really interested in negotiating one with you, but you know what, we'll do a one-time agreement, one-time deal for this guy. So there's a level of, of you know of informality. Now, if uh, the minister decides not to surrender Bill, mm -hmm. does that mean Bill is completely off the hook? And uh, like, 
or can he be charged for anything he's done in the other country if he decides not to send it back? Okay. It well depends on the situation. So with Bill, Bill is off the hook in the sense that he can't be prosecuted in Canada because we don't take jurisdiction over assaults that happen in foreign countries, not regular common assaults. He definitely can't go back to Costa Rica because there's probably an arrest warrant out for him. If it's a serious enough crime, Bill might not be able to leave Canada because if there's a red notice floating around out there, an Interpol red notice, which is an international arrest warrant, uh, you know, Bill goes to England and then he's on his way to Belgium and whoops, somebody grabs him at the airport. Hey, buddy, you're going back to Costa Rica. And Bill is fictional. Dwight Hickey, the polar bear guy, is very real. Dwight was offered a job up in Alert, which is a Canadian military base, very, very, very far north. And he, I, I became you know, acquainted with Dwight after, after the case, so he told me this story. He got offered this job, and he was looking at it and tracing his route, and he realized he would have to go through US customs in Greenland in order to get to alert. Why, I don't know, but this was the situation that he was in. And he realized that if he went through US Customs, he'd be arrested. He's still wanted on federal environmental charges in Georgia, so he can't cross the border. He doesn't know if there's an Interpol red notice out of uh, one polar bear run, probably not. I don't think he'd bring in the man from Interpol to collect that crime, but there might be. So there's his liberty his ability to make a living and his security being threatened by this extradition situation, which even our Minister of Justice thought was so wonky, he ordered him not extradited. So people can be left in situations. Julian Assange right, is in a very weird situation. If he steps foot outside that embassy, the British authorities will grab him and send him to Sweden. So certainly it can restrict your life. Uh, you talked a little bit about reciprocity being one of the main motivators for signing an extradition agreement in the first place. And you also talked a little bit about some of the exceptions in cases where you do have uh, an extradition agreement, but you would choose not to extradite. Um, picking up on the Assange comment, what, what, what would be maybe a, a, an incentive to not sign an extradition agreement with a particular country? What are the reasons you wouldn't engage in that kind of bilateral? We don't have an extradition treaty with Iran. So there's, there's a good example. Uh, the government certainly looks at the human rights record of the country in question and you know, is quite realistic. Would we ever be able to send our citizens there even if we wanted to? We don't have an extradition treaty with Saudi Arabia or Qatar. Um, I don't want to pick on the Middle East. There's lots of other bad ones. Um, sorry, I'm thinking like uh, Ecuador and Sweden. Do they? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering whether there's a reason they would not extradite, why Ecuador wouldn't extradite Assange. Is it, is it related to some of these uh, you know, more procedural decisions, whether they have evidence or the treatment of him, the fear of treatment, or is it because they just don't have an agreement? And whether they use that. Or is it because they don't have an agreement and whether they use that? I don't think there is a Sweden ex Ecuador bilateral agreement. Um, because presumably Sweden would have asked for him by now. Uh, this, that's, it's a funny situation, that one, because Ecuador, Ecuador's president in particular, clearly liked the idea that Julian Assange was always poking a stick in at the Americans. And what the effort they've been going under is to say to Sweden, look, and, and you know, he has said this through his lawyers, I'll go as long as you guarantee me that I'm not going to be sent anywhere else after. They refuse. They just keep saying no. He has also made what I think is a very reasonable request. The Ecuadorian government has said, hey, Swedish prosecutors, he's only wanted for questioning at this point. He hasn't been charged in Sweden. Hey, Swedish prosecutors, come to the Ecuadorian embassy in London. You may question him for days if you want to. Seems very reasonable. Nope. They won't do that which just feeds into the suspicion that there's something more to it than that. And this is uh, like one of the lessons in this stuff, um, 
that I always try to teach our students is that it's a mixture of law and politics. It's not pure law at all. There's always political, diplomatic considerations uh, underpinning a lot of it. I wouldn't say all of it. Some of it is very meat and potatoes stuff, you know, run-of-the-mill narcotics trafficker, fraudster, cyber criminal. You know, people are extradited out of Toronto every day, practically. But a lot of the cases, the cases with international implications, uh, can be quite interesting. Yes. Does would like that principle of like is it like diplomatic immunity once you have like an extradition agreement? Is like you know understanding what diplomatic immunity would be that um, each country honors their own laws, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if if you stopped if one country did not hold that sort of agreement, then the other country wouldn't either. Is is the same thing? Uh, well, both. I mean, it may very well. So if a government refuses to extradite an individual to another country, even though there's a treaty obligation to do so, then they've breached the treaty. Right? Now that's if they don't ground it in some exception under the treaty. And the treaties have often some open language in them that give the governments a bit of wiggle room. Right? To say, in this situation we're invoking this exception in the treaty. So then you have an Breach the treaty, you've gone under the rules. Uh, either way, though, it does have diplomatic implications. And exactly as you described, you know, country, the next time you make an extradition request from that country, they might say, hey, remember two years ago? You when you wouldn't extradite Bill? Yeah, well, guess what? You're not getting back that guy you want. What countries don't do with extradition, for the most part, is drag each other to court. Because you know, there's only one court, the International Court of Justice. And they typically don't exert that kind of energy. Except in a case that just came down uh, from the International Court a couple of months ago where Belgium brought an action against Senegal because Senegal refused to extradite a former Chadian dictator who was wanted for all kinds of nasty stuff. And they actually won that case. So that was a, a breach of international law case that was won. Very unusual in the extradition context. But yes, it has implications. Yes. When you were talking about the Mark Emery case, uh, you indicated that the legal field maybe was kind of looking forward to it going all the way up to answer a few questions, and then he didn't fight the extradition, so everybody's kind of left like, oh, there's our big shot, it's kind of gone. Is, is there some sort of I, I mean, no is the short answer. Uh, it's the decision of the individual who is subject to extradition, whether or not they, they waive their rights to all of that procedure or not. Uh, nobody can really tromp in and say, you know, well, we, we want to fight it on his behalf anyway. I mean, in a weird situation where there was something wrong and the court was able to say, you know, I, I don't think this waiver is a, a true consent then I can imagine a situation where the court might say, well, we're going to have to let the process go because this guy says he's consenting to extradition. We don't think he is truly consenting because he's being, pressure is being exerted on him in some really irregular way. But people very often consent to extradition. And in fact, consenting is sometimes the best strategy because most of the people, like I've told you a lot of horror stories here. Most of the people extradited from Canada are criminals and they are guilty. Okay? Just to leave it on a positive note. And their best <laughs> advice 
if they get, if there's a request out for them, they are best advised to get a lawyer here in Canada to retain a lawyer for them in the requested state to negotiate a plea bargain. Right? I will not contest extradition if you drop that charge and if you drop that charge and I agree to do five years instead of 20. And the American prosecutors will often say, okay. Because plea bargaining is much the same anywhere. They'd rather get a result. And so in those situations where uh, your client, you think, clearly did what he is alleged to have done down in the U.S., then that's the smartest strategy, in fact, is just to get in there and negotiate the best result on the far side of the board that you can get. Yes? That's, that's an interesting case. And Brazil is like that. A lot of European countries are like that. And what's, uh, what's being described is the constitutional arrangements of the country forbid them extraditing their own citizens. Germany is like that. They won't extradite their own citizens. What they do in an ideal world is exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction. Right? So say... A, German citizen has committed murder in Canada, gets back to Germany, Canada says to Germany, hey, can you extradite that guy here so we can try him for murder? Germany would say, sorry, our constitution says we don't extradite our citizens to Canada or anywhere. But give us the evidence and we'll have a trial. They, they do that. We typically don't do that in Canada, but other countries do. So that's the way the problem is negotiated around. Whether it always works that way in practice would be another, another issue entirely. Because some governments um, use that kind of thing as an excuse to not do anything. You know, are you ever going to extradite your national for that thing that happened here? Oh, yes, yes, we've spent the last five years looking at that case. Now, the, the Russian diplomats who, or diplomat who uh, was drunk driving in Ottawa and killed that, killed that woman. I, I think eventually there was a trial. It was a long time after. So in law, no problem. In politics, often there are problems. Well, OK, yeah, one more. I was wondering something slightly different. And this had to do more with deportation, in a way. Um, I know that there have been cases in the US and also in Canada where people are being deported to the birthplace of their parents. Mm -hmm. And so I know there are different countries that are having problems with criminals from the US who are being dumped on their shores, who are then creating more violent situations in the countries. Do the countries have any recourse when someone's being, like may actually reject the person from coming? If Canada decides we're gonna dump someone in Guatemala, Jamaica, wherever, is there any way to prevent Immigration is not really my thing, um, but there are things that some governments will do to prevent unwanted individuals from coming back. But under most uh, countries' laws, it's very difficult to exclude your citizen if they are your citizen. And that often citizenship extends to the children of citizens. So they, uh, you know, they may find ways to make the individual's life difficult. And sometimes states will get into dialogues about, look, don't don't send that guy here, keep that guy, and there are deals made because that's politics. But I think what you're describing is a problem. It's a problem on the, on the flip side as well. Uh, I know there's people from Caribbean countries who came to Canada when they were very young, uh, get into scrapes with the law, never got any kind of solid Canadian immigration status, and are deported back to Jamaica, back to Bermuda, where they've never been, where they don't know anyone, and where it's, in, where it's dangerous for them. And that's, that's a problem under immigration law as well. I know that they're dealing with it all the time. OK, well, look, thank you very much. I'd be happy to, to talk to anybody afterwards. But uh, thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it.